Howdy, y'all. Welcome back to the shit show. Sorry, it's been, well, a while. If you check this title before you clicked, that fairly well summarizes the focal point of our story today. If you can still remember anything from what was evidently a thousand fucking years back when I posted last, I said I'd gotten some intel on the weird donation with the creepy journals, etc. That's where this installment comes in, and I fully intended to upload it just after the update on Doug, but then everything got really fucking weird. Buckle in, this one's gonna be wild. So, a while ago, by which I mean who fucking knows how long ago now, it was just me, Sam, and Matt working. Me in mending, Matt on the desk, Sam in the stacks. I can sorta kinda see the front desk from my not office, if I'm really looking. And for whatever reason, I happened to be doing so just as someone stepped inside. There's just a vibe sometimes about people's intentions. The guy entering the library wasn't in a uniform, but he was in a suit, and he looked unnervingly official, very much like he meant business. Matt doesn't like people who mean business, so I, purely on instinct, headed out to Cirque. As I knew he would, the man approached the desk. Evening, he said, nodding. That wasn't good. Nobody nodded like that unless they meant real business. Evening, I echoed because that was how he said it and sometimes G's are too serious. What can I do for you? Well, gentlemen, let me introduce myself. My name is Brigsby Leading Him. I'm a private investigator. He paused here, extracting a badge from his pocket and holding it up for Matt and I to inspect. And I have reason to believe you may be in possession of some... artifacts. Would you mind if I took a look around? I glanced at Matt with a lowercase g, not an uppercase one because g's are serious as it is, and because I was trying to be inconspicuous. He didn't look like he was planning on opening his mouth anytime soon, so I said, sure, probably a lot too enthusiastically. Ah, uh, can I ask what artifacts? Exactly. Might be able to just point them right out to you. The man looked around in a somewhat Machiavellian manner, though I interpreted it as an over-dramatization of checking his surroundings to be sure we were alone. I've been on a particular individual's trail for some time. His current whereabouts are unknown. But the last security camera footage I was able to track down on him was right outside the street, on his way into and out of this building. He had a bunch of boxes with him, and when he left, he was empty-handed. Sound familiar? Uh, I paused, genuinely considering. We get a lot of donations, so I'm not totally sure I could pinpoint one person. Do you have... Any specifics? He leaned in closer, voice dropping to a whisper that wafted warm, sugary breath over my face. These wouldn't have been ordinary donations. They would have been of the occult variety. Oh, I said because fucking duh. I know exactly who you're talking about. We've got... Here, just follow me. I started to head out from behind the desk, 
but Matt full-on mom-armed me, physically halting me in my tracks before I could make it more than two steps. I got it, he told me. You stay up here. This time I glanced at him, capital G. Okay? He did not glance or even glance back, just walked around the counter indicating that Rixby leading him, P.I., should accompany him. In case you were wondering, yes, I did in fact get instantaneous flashbacks to Matt marching upstairs with Sam and leaving me to wonder whether or not he'd come back. They were totally, completely unwarranted flashbacks, though. I knew that, because Matt was just taking this guy to look through some stuff we'd had for probably two years, and we definitely already experienced the worst of it with the Ouija board fiasco. The most that could come of it was the rest of the shit that was brought in with it being taken off our hands. Straightforward enough. But Adam, you might ask, if everything was kosher, why wouldn't Matt want you to take Brigsby Leaningham, P.I., to the occult artifact donations? Yeah, great fucking question. We'll get there. So, for a while, I was just hanging out, and then Sam finished shelving, so we were both just hanging out. Nobody was coming in, so we were mostly just taking turns seeing if we could flip rubber bands into the gap between two slightly askewed ceiling tiles. A game Sam won by an absolute landslide, much to my chagrin. Once we'd lost enough of them to the abyss, though, we moved on to tidying up behind the desk, which Sam enjoyed to an unsettling degree, and then to take turns reading each other whispered, dramatized passages of a stray Harlem Quinn romance we found lying on a cart. Pro tip, if you ever come across an old enough, worn enough trade paper pack romance at your own local library, Hold the spine flat against the palm of your hand and let it fall open. The page it lands on will, at least seven times out of ten, be the filthiest one in the book. And if it is, it will one thousand times out of ten be the most hysterical thing you've ever read. You're welcome. Anyway, after a while, in the middle of a sentence about a Highlander stroking something or other, possibly just hair, but who really knows, Sam stopped to look up, prompting me to also look up. Matt was back, alone. His hands were covered in blood. He just stood there for a moment, and let them drip onto the floor, and Sam just stared and let him let them drip. Finally, to Sam, he said, Man the front, kid. And then in my direction, You, come with me. I went. In the back office, good old Brigsby was lying on the floor with Matt's pocket knife sticking out of his neck. Damn, I said. So he's not, uh, not a P.I., Matt finished for me. Yeah, no. How did you... Had a feeling. Then why did you... Because I wanted to corner him and get him away from you two. I nodded because, okay, enough said. The boxes containing the journals and divination tools were both open, and several of the items inside were lying askew spread across the floor as though they'd been shuffled around during an altercation, which I realized they likely had. 
One of the journals, however, was separate from the rest, having been placed with clear intent upon the countertop nearest Bigsby's head. It was open only to the first page bearing the strange symbols that Alice and Jenny and I had marveled over when the books had first come into our possession. Fuckers started reading it and I... Matt paused to cough, then opted for his sleeve over his bloodied hand to wipe his mouth. <clears throat> I could tell shit was going down about halfway through the page. It got way too quiet, like the room was just sealed off all of a sudden, and I couldn't hear fuck all except his voice. Then my head just started tingling, and that was enough to convince me to put a stop to that shit, which his crazy ass wasn't too keen on, so did what I had to do. Pretty much instantaneously, a awful fucking idea came to me. What if we just took him upstairs? I said. Matt blinked at me. I uh, mean, he said. I shrugged. Grab his feet. Now, listen. I know, I know. It wasn't the most morally sound move. But what you have to understand is the havoc this place would release on, at the very least, the immediate vicinity without Matt. He's contracted in, and that keeps it at bay. If someone hauled his ass off to prison and he lost the building, either everything would be fucked beyond belief, or one of us would inherently become responsible. We looked out for Matt so he can look out for us. Simple as that. So I figured, no body, no crime. Wiley could scrub the tape easy enough, and we'd be in the clear. I grabbed not Bigsby leading him, P.I.'s, feet, or I guess maybe Bigsby leading him, not P.I. I'm not clear on whether that was actually his name. The mechanical room was dark, save for the dim emergency light in the center of the ceiling, we dropped the body with a dense thud as soon as we'd made it fully through the entrance, both panting with the effort of dragging likely 275 pounds of dead weight up the entire flight of stairs. I couldn't help but take a note of the eerie glow cast over the pallid skin of the face, making it appear as though it had been lifeless far longer than it had in reality. How do you reckon we do this? Matt asked. How do you reckon we do this? Matt asked, hands on knees. Smoker's lungs still not quite up to speed. Never wanted to get their attention before. I flicked my eyes upward to the assumed nest above the doorway. It wasn't dripping this time, but it was clearly still there, though poorly lit enough to prove difficult to make out. Seems like the primary concern should be feeding for the... little ones? I said, because fuck them kids, but using the word babies to describe the horrors that should have ended, and almost did end Matt last time we had a run-in with them, felt a little tone deaf. So maybe we just, I don't know, leave them here and they'll get him when they're ready? We could come back and check later, make sure he's gone. Okay, Matt agreed, riding himself. Yeah. So that was that. We headed back downstairs in silence. 
And then I told Matt I was going to lock the doors until Della came in to clean, given the blood soaking cozily into several sections of flooring that we would undoubtedly only drive in deeper if we attempted to remedy the situation ourselves. He nodded, offering me a two-finger salute, and split off toward the desk, likely to let Sam know we'd survived. I headed to the front, pulling the doors flush together, and raised my hand to turn the lock. But before I could get quite that far, something slammed with a wet smack into the glass directly parallel to my face. You'd think we'd be so used to jump scares around here that nothing could startle us anymore. But as a self-proclaimed pussy, I jumped back a solid foot, barely catching myself in time to keep from planting ass first onto the ground. That foot of space was all the girl outside needed to push her way in before I had a second to carry out my intent with the lock. Well, I guess girl is a loose term. It was most of one, though. It was really just that a slice seemed to have been carved out of her left side, from just below her eye socket into her upper thigh. No arm or anything there, pieces of rib shaved off, or really, they just hadn't finished generating. But I didn't know that yet. I guess I screamed. I don't remember doing it, but I don't know why else Matt would have come running. Oh, oh, he said, halting in his tracks just behind me. Oh, fuck. Oh, God. We are called, the kind of girl said. There'd already been a steady trickle of blood streaming from the side of her mouth that wasn't formed. But when she parted her lips, it began gushing, coating her teeth in a viscous red-orange film. She didn't appear to be in any way perturbed about this development, which for some reason was the element that chilled me to the bone. Uh, I asked, because my brain was in my fucking guts. By the right, she elaborated, unhelpfully. There was blood everywhere, I realize now. Her dark skin was glistening with it, and I absently felt guilty for failing to successfully lock her out and, by default, causing Della more work. Adam, Matt said. That was all, but knowing each of his intonations as well as my own, I understood that this one was a command. W wh who who are you? I stammered, disregarding him. The calling. She responded, blinking back at me with dull, inexpressive eyes. Adam. Matt's hand was on my shoulder now, and I shook it off. No, I told him. Then to her, the fuck does that mean? In the aftermath of the rite, she said, we, the culling, are called to eliminate the disciples who have failed to rise to enlightenment. Who among your herd is enlightened? enlightened. Who among my... I started, but was cut off with a silencing wave of her hand. Not you. It's not your herd. You... She was looking past me now, through me. You need to turn around, Matt said, speaking directly to her for the first time, and walk back out that door. She simply stared ahead, unfazed, and repeated, 
who among your herd is enlightened? Out, Matt insisted firmly. Now. Instead, she took a step further inside, which inadvertently meant a step further towards me. I'm not sure what safety I thought it might afford me, but I caught my breath and held it in my throat, refusing to inhale what I knew would be the iron dampened air around her. She was breathing plenty, enough for the both of us. Quickly I surmised that this was because she was sniffing me. After a moment, her brow furrowed and her eyes bore with something akin to accusation into mine. There is no enlightenment here, she deduced. None anywhere. It stinks of putrid, rotting ignorance. Where was the right held? When Matt grabbed her by the half of her throat that existed, his thumb sunk with a wet squelch into the exposed mass of tendon and muscle on the other side, which made me feel like I was about a quarter of a second from meeting God. But she didn't seem bothered in the least didn't even lift a hand to try and stop him, like it wasn't worth her time. And probably it wasn't. When Matt tried to push her back, he may as well have been duking it out with a wall of steel. She didn't budge, not an inch. In his defense, he didn't let an ounce of the fear undoubtedly coursing through his entire being show on his face. Instead, he insisted once again, That's enough. You're not welcome here. I said it's time to go. I'll give you a second. On a scale of 1 to 10, to guess how poorly you think that went. If you guessed anything under a fucking thousand, you're SOL. Not only did she slam him straight to the ground, his head hitting the tile with the sickening crack, she also stepped directly onto his wrist to surpass him, causing his arm to elicit a crunching sound bones just weren't designed to make. I winced but remained otherwise frozen warring internally with whether to stay and help him or run as quick as I could ahead of the girl to warn Sam. Fortunately, as per usual, Matt made the call for me. Go, he said breathless, but clear and alert. I'm good, go, I went. To my absolute horror, when I turned back, I saw that she already gained an ungodly amount of ground. Somehow, already, she'd nearly reached the desk where Sam was still standing, and long before I'd been able to intervene if I'd tried, she'd caught his attention. Eyes wide, he stumbled back from the counter taking in her left side, or I guess lack thereof, and her apparently non-existent concern for her condition. Sam! I hollered from behind her, but it was too late. She'd made it to him already, slapping her sticky blood-coated hand down onto the desk before him. You... She seethed. Where was the right held? Something shifted then in his expression. I wasn't sure what at the time, and it was so minuscule, so close to imperceptible that I nearly missed it. But he stopped shying away from her eyes swallowed down his discomfort, 
and said, Upstairs. Finally, a tension I hadn't noticed she'd been holding in her one existing shoulder seemed to relax. Is the tone still there? Yes. Was the response Sam opted for in place of asking her what the absolute bloody fuck was going on? Would you like me to take you? Rather than verbal assent, the girl held her singular bloody hand out to Sam. I made it to them now and I shook my head at him once with a curt, stern finality. His gaze flitted briefly to mine, but didn't linger. He stepped out from behind the counter and, stealing himself, took her hand. What are you doing? I demanded, grabbing the hem of his shirt as he made to turn away. It's cool, he told me tapping my knuckle with his to indicate that I should let go. I've got it. I'll be honest, a part of me wanted to just let him. Not because I'd ever want anything bad to happen to him. Of course, it's just... Sometimes this shit starts to weigh on you. But I didn't do that. I learned fairly quickly with Sam that if he had his mind made up, he was going to follow through with whatever it was he had decided he was going to do, and there really wasn't any point in trying to dissuade him, so I followed him. He didn't try to stop me, likely for within the same ballpark of reasoning, and the girl didn't seem to give a shit that I was there as long as she thought she was getting what she wanted. So. Win-win, I guess. Anyway, I didn't know precisely what Sam's plan was, but I'd have ventured to bet it flew entirely out the fucking window as soon as the girl saw the body of possibly Bixby leading him, definitely not P.I., lying dead on the floor. The robodactyls still hadn't got to him yet, it would seem, and the way the girl started wailing, you'd think she'd been sawed in half. Well, in half the other way. It was easily the most visceral, guttural scream crying I've ever heard in my twenty-some years on this earth and the sheer volume and intensity of it drew my attention momentarily from the fact that she was saying something. Fire! Is what it was. Some shit started clicking then. That's some wordplay for you, because shit started clicking like in my brain, but also literally audibly some shit started clicking. It was a sound I remembered well enough that I didn't have a ton of time to zero in on the revelations I was having. On account of the imminent descent of winged monstrosities, I guess it looked like I was about to piss myself. Uh, I was. Because Sam took that opportunity to project his voice over the unceasing shrieks and tell me, It's okay. They're not... They won't hurt us. Just let them come. I didn't know what the fuck that meant, but I figured worst case scenario, I'd be dead quick and then it wasn't really my problem anymore. So I stood unmoving and watched them clamber clumsily down from their nest. The screaming was rapidly shifting from spreading into a cacophony of something more sinister and abstract, and technically nothing was happening to the almost body before me, but I began to perceive it differently as the mechanical bat birds started to swoop down upon it. It felt less like a malformed body and more like the idea of one and I shuddered when I remembered something it had said downstairs about we. 
it did in fact sound more akin to multiple voices than a singular now. And it wasn't quite moving in the tandem way that a body belonging to a singular consciousness should. It was becoming more disjointed, twitching and flailing, and I realized frantically scrambling to protect the body of our dearly departed Brixby. The hell? Sam said, which drew my attention back to him and returned my fascination to the fact that, true to his word, the flying horrors were indeed not attacking us. Yeah, what the hell? I echoed. How come they're not eating us? Sam looked over to me, a little guilty, and shrugged. I... I don't know. They just don't hurt me. And I knew if you were with me, they wouldn't hurt you either. I don't have a good answer right now. I'm trying to figure it out. I didn't press him on it, because fine, fair enough. I knew realistically that he'd been up here on his own on several occasions. For every time I'd caught him standing at the foot of the stairs, there were probably two times I hadn't and he was still kicking so far. Sometimes shit's just weird here. I think we're all aware enough of that. We went back to watching the creatures rip apart the corpses. Plural. They were both certainly dead now, before us. Viscera flying haphazardly between them. The frenzy making it difficult to tell how much either of them was left after some time. They're getting bigger, I noted quietly to myself, juxtaposing a mental image of the winged horror's size when I'd seen them last to the swarm in front of me now. Yeah, Sam agreed, scratching anxiously at his right arm with his left. Then, to my surprise... They're doing okay without their mom, I think. Doesn't seem like they really need to eat often at all. This is more like a treat, I guess? I wanted to grill him about how he knew anything about their mother. The one whom Matt had shot to save me before Sam was ever here. And also why the fuck he knew anything about their eating habits. But this didn't feel like the time, partly because we were watching two people, or people adjacent beings at least, being eviscerated, but also because the wailing was back, except that practically everything about it had changed. It was hard to say, really how I could tell they were the same voices as before, but I knew it. Sam did too. I could tell from the way he stilled next to me. They were disembodied now, though. There was nothing for them to tie themselves to, now that their host was gone. But that didn't keep them from speaking their peace. Our, Our final form was never reached. The voices whispered, from nowhere and everywhere around us at once. As though someone had flipped a kill switch, the avian nightmare stopped cold, frozen in midair. We, we have, have generated, generated incomplete vessels in, in the past. past. So, at first, we bade it no mind. But this time, there was a cause. The, the rite, rite was, was not, not completed. completed. Something cut it short. Something, Something cold, father. Now, this set off a couple of warning bells for me. Because how had Matt's pocket knife taken out something we were currently being led to believe was more powerful than what had appeared to be a relatively small, three quarters formed roughly late teenage girl who laid him out flat with nothing more than the flick of her fingers. However, I didn't 
feel particularly invited to toss my two cents in the well, so I made the informed decision to not. As I had anticipated, the conglomerate of unison speech continued, gargling and tangling over itself. This will be a heavy, heavy weight, weight to bear. To bear. A, a handsome, handsome debt, debt to pay. The, the culling, culling will, will not, not rest until a vessel is rebuilt. Until we avenge father, father by ascending his conqueror in his stead. Every drop of blood in my body felt as though it was slowly, agonizingly turning to ice. I didn't have the details, but I didn't need to. I understood what I was hearing. Whatever bullshit crisis this was, B. Leadingham, untitled, had been its fucking wrangler. And now Matt was set to take his place. No. I heard more than felt myself say. No, you don't fucking touch him. There has to be something else you want. What is it? What's an acceptable trade? There was a long, swelling pause. I thought, briefly, that my counter wasn't going to be entertained. Then, airily... As though the sound was seeping from the walls, the herd may come to the agreement as one to sacrifice something that can neither be traded nor bought. I heard Sam swallow next to me and wondered if he was as nauseous as I was. What do you mean? He asked. What does that mean? Something can't be traded or bought. We understand it in far more depth than your kind could ever dream of. But what we ask of you is, in your terms, time. time. Sam and I exchanged a glance. As long as, long as you, you come, come to, to a consensus. consensus. The voices went on. It, it shan't, shan't be much. much. Not enough to impact your dismal, dismal life, life expectancies. expectancies. Do, Do this, this, and your shepherd, shepherd shall be free. free. Fine, I said instantaneously. I know, not making deals with shit isn't even in the rules, which is undoubtedly because Matt didn't think he'd ever hire anyone stupid enough to need something so obvious spelled out for them. I'm truly one in a million. In my defense, though, Sam shadowed me. Fine. He said, too. Whatever. Just leave him alone. We, we shall remain, remain here, here, the course promised, for the rise and set of seven, seven suns, on the eve of the eighth, eighth rising, unless your deliberation has sooner ceased. ceased. We, we will collect, collect our, our due. due. If each member of the herd does not consent to sacrifice their measure of time willingly, your shepherd's ascension shall commence. The sound wasn't any different, really, than any of the breaks in speech that had been thus far. It was the feeling that told us the conversation was over like the air in the room was moving differently somehow, even before the monstrosities had unpaused. They lagged a moment, but sluggishly started to move again, though by no means at their typical pace. They dragged themselves along the floor, their metalwork bodies suddenly too heavy for their wings to support, leaving trails of sludgy blood in their wake. Sam, bless his heart, looked concerned. Do you think they're hurt? He wondered aloud, kneeling to inspect the nearest one more closely. I was morbidly, desperately curious as to whether he had any idea that they were somehow at fault for his lack of an existence outside of the library. 
I'd had suspicions straight from the get-go that he wasn't fully convinced by our cover story. But unpacking his relationship to them in the midst of the current situation didn't feel appropriate. So rather than questioning it, I opted to let him go about his mother hen fretting for a minute until finally the things kicked their half-speed settings and darted back up to the ceiling to hunker down again. Iron bull bellies full of presumably human flesh. Maybe they were just booting back up? I said, clapping a hand on his shoulder. Come on, let's get the fuck out of here. Matt's hurt, I think. Not bad. That around here means an injury's not life-threatening. But he might have a concussion, and his wrist has got to be broken. Oh, damn. Sam said, surveying the damage on the ground and then waving a hand at it dismissively. They'll... they'll lick the rest up later. Let's go. Matt was looking for us, unsurprisingly, when he made it back out to the main floor. Where is she? He asked, trying and failing to fully suppress how frantically he was studying both Sam and myself for injuries. Sam opened his mouth, but I cut him off before he could get a word out. Gone, I relayed, simply. He couldn't, of course, know what we'd agreed to. I was sure Sam and I were on the same page about it, but just in case, I wasn't going to take any chances. Matt nodded and then clenched his jaw, likely against the pain in his skull. Okay? I asked. Devil's here. He deflected. Think we're still gonna shut it down for the night, though. Just give her some time to get everything straightened up. You could head home, Adam, if you want. All right, I said. I didn't, though. I think he knew I wouldn't. Instead, Sam and I pretended not to notice the snoring approximately five minutes after he disappeared into the back to do paperwork. And then we got to work helping Della clean up the floors, only with whatever products she shoved into our hands, naturally. It wasn't until the next night that we called the meeting. Unsurprisingly, it was unanimous. Della even tipped her head in confirmation. I'd like to call back to the beginning of this post when we discuss the universal understanding of the utmost importance in this building centering unwaveringly on protecting Matt. The discussion didn't go down without questions. Alice wanted to know how much time we were offering up. We had no clue. And Horace wondered how we knew whatever this entity was would play fairly. We didn't. And Jenny requested that we repeat every detail of the encounter to the letter in case there was something she could pick out that we'd managed to miss. There wasn't. Wiley perhaps the most unwaveringly loyal to Matt of us all, only asked what we needed to do to seal the deal. We decided we'd take the time we were allotted just to do whatever we felt we could to prepare ourselves. It was still too fresh on my mind the day after, too suffocating, which gave me the perfect opportunity to shift my focus to the story about Doug. But I planned to write all of this out before we made it to the end of the week, and to post it as quickly as I could to try and garner some advice. That was apparently a year ago. The funny thing is, in all our consideration, we never thought that whatever time we might forfeit may not be taken off the ends of our lives, but rather carved right out of the present. 
I don't know what the date was. Everything is too blurry around the edges. This platform only shows me that I last posted one year ago. So maybe it was a little longer, maybe a little less, I'm not sure. It's been nearly a week now that we've been back. If it's all the same, I'd rather not get into the specifics of waking up to the realization that I was missing the last year of my life. We're operating the way we always do, the way we always have. We're moving along. We experienced it together, at least. Jenny started the group call within 60 seconds of the lot of us returning to awareness. And I was surprised by the gravity of the relief that shocked my system when I learned that if I was finally losing the last shred of sanity I had left, at least I wasn't doing it alone. The biggest difference I've placed so far is that every book in every box in the room where the donations were held, along with the boxes themselves and everything else that came in them as well, has vanished. I want to know what happened to them, where they are now, if they're anywhere at all. If they were destroyed or buried or if they glitched out of existence when our deal was fulfilled. But I can't ask. Matt's right wrist clicks when he's typing now, like a long-heeled fracture that was never set quite back in place. But as far as we can tell, that's the closest to any memory he has of the events of that night. As far as we can tell, he's none the wiser about the bargain we made. As far as we can tell, he has no idea we were ever gone.